I teach at Goddard College. I'm the uh, secretary of the board of the Yoga Science Foundation, which uh, is sponsoring my presence here. Uh, so, on uh, tomorrow afternoon at 5.35, Edward Frankel uh, is going to be speaking, and this uh, quote is from his description of his talk. He said, I will argue that in fact mathematics is a secret world full of elegance and beauty that is deeply entangled with our world, but exists separately and independently as a kind of platonic reality. All right, now that, that is ex a wonderful statement, and I agree with a great deal of it, but not all of it. Uh, so I would take out the word secret there. And I would certainly take out, being at a conference on non-duality, that this exists separately and independently as a kind of platonic reality. So nonetheless, uh, there have been informal polls of mathematicians and they have come out that about 95% of mathematicians would tend to agree with Frankel, and a, a lunatic fringe of 5% would agree with me. So, but this, this is, uh, so I would, I would totally agree that mathematics is a world full of elegance and beauty, deeply entangled with our world, but uh, my view of the entanglement is diff different from Frankel's. And I think the, uh, the top is hard to read on these. Math entanglement, internal or external. So in Frankel's world, mathematics is separate from everything else. It exists somewhere uh, or nowhere. Uh, this is a Platonist view, a plate, and we'll see Plato in a moment. It's a dual view. Uh, and I'll, I'll claim that it's a, a logical view, uh, whereas my view is constructivist as opposed to Platonist, non-dual as opposed to dual, and I would say algorithmic as opposed to logical. So you have to ask the question then, why, why, is, uh, math why do mathematicians believe that there's an external reality? And there are two major reasons for this. One is that the external reality provides a foundation for mathematics, a place to start. Uh, you need to start somewhere, and uh, so that, that is, is one reason. The other is that it has room for infinity, uh, and for even for higher infinities. Now, I'll come back to these two, and, and most of my talk will be uh, looking at this necessity for uh, an external reality, uh, but just mention that in, in Christian Europe, uh, mathematics was, for many centuries, practiced in uh, monasteries, uh, and math was seen to reside in the mind of God. So Frankel's separate reality could be the mind of God. Also, we have a human tendency uh, to see objects which are external to ourself, to see objects which we think are real, like this glass, as external uh, to ourselves, and this is what Tom was talking about in a way, that uh, we, we tend to think that, these, all, that this glass is completely independent of me, and yet th there is an interdependence. Don Hoffman uh, last year uh, gave a wonderful talk in which he argued very persuasively that we construct what we see. So I would say we construct not only what we see, but what we think about when we do mathematics. And the external reality can also be seen as a political move, which has, a, as a consequence, there is only one true mathematics. Uh, alternative views are suppressed, like the constructive one, which I'm going to describe somewhat how it is, has been suppressed in our culture. And I tend to celebrate variety in mathematics. Last year, I talked about Japanese temple geometry, which is a wonderful example of sophisticated mathematics, very different in many ways from the mathematics that is practiced in, in our society. Whoops, something happened here. Uh, okay, I th there we go. Okay, foundations. So let me quote William Byers. He says, even the idea that everything is equivalent to itself deserves some serious thought. It assumes a stable world of mathematical objects that does not change over time. 
It is an assumption we make about things, a fundamental assumption that makes mathematical discourse possible. So that's a nice statement of why we need this external world. A fantasy, I would say, uh, and, and I find it a little troubling to start mathematics with a fantasy. Uh, so um, how do we get, um, oops, going too fast here. Okay, um, all right, next, that's, that's, that is the dualist foundation of mathematics. That's where we start. An alternative view is that we start with time and space. Uh, in time, we count one, two, three, four, five, six. In space, we measure how far are things apart. And I would say that mathematics is based on the human activities of counting and measuring, which are structured by time and space. The 19th century mathematician Leopold Kronecker said, God gave us the natural numbers, all else is the work of man. Uh, of course, he, he was using God as a, uh, metaphorically there, I think. Mathematics is closely allied with science. So how do, how do we get the stable universe uh, once we go beyond the natural numbers and measuring? Numbers seem to be given to us. We, you know, Tom pointed out that we can use uh, arithmetic modulo 12 and 4 plus 10 equals 2. But if we, if we specify that we're talking about ordinary numbers with an ordinary equality, then there doesn't seem to be much choice in arithmetic. But beyond that, uh, there is a lot of choice. Uh, so what Mass Hilbert spaces, uh, Riemann surfaces, all of these things, how do they have a, uh, a, a, a reality? So Eric Bishop, who is going to be sort of the hero of this talk, a mathematician who has uh, changed the way that I think, uh, said that we have a notion of intentional identity. In this imagined world, uh, objects have absolute identity. They are the same as themselves. They are not the same as other objects. Uh, but we have, within mathematics, an intentional identity, which means that we can repeat a construction. This brings mathematics sort of into the realm of the rest of science, where experiments have to be repeatable. So mathematical constructions have to be repeatable as well. And if you carry out a construction or look at somebody else's construction and then you repeat it, this is intentional identity. And this gives us the stability that we need to, uh, to do mathematics. And notice that intentional identity is not a mathematical predicate. We have no way of deciding given two constructions is one a repetition of the other because that depends on the intention of the people who carried out the constructions. All right, let's do a little bit of history now. Go back to Plato. Plato said, mathematicians speak as if they were really doing and achieving something, as if their words had some action in view, talking loudly about squaring and applying and so on. But he says, the, the whole thing is only about knowledge and not knowledge of things which come into being for a moment and then disappear, but knowledge of what always is. So we're back then in the external realm of where things last forever and absolute truth about this. So the, the, this, the, this points back in Plato's day to an argument among mathematicians. Are we doing something or are we merely finding out what's true in some imagined external universe. And this is really uh, the difference between proofs and algorithms. Proofs discover truth, algorithms do something. A proof leads from assumptions to conclusion. An algorithm takes an input and yields an output. Mathematicians use algorithms in their proofs. Computer scientists use proofs to verify the correctness, the utility of their algorithms. And if we look at this and think, well, it's an open question, which is more important? Uh, we might come to the view of considering mathematics as a very high level programming language, which is essentially how I have come to view it. So this argument between the people who thought in terms of algorithms and those who thought in terms of proofs uh, 
was sort of peaceful coexistence for a millennia. Uh, up until early in the 19th century, uh, most mathematicians, well, let me say that during that time, the big bone of contention was infinity. And already uh, the Greeks had asked, is, is infinity potential or is it actual? The universe seems to be finite in some ways. Uh, so where are the infinities? And for the most part, the, uh, the smart money was on uh, potential infinity, that infinity was potential. We can count up to 101, and therefore we can count up to 102, etc. cetera. Uh, Gauss, who was uh, the uh, preeminent mathematician of the early uh, 19th century, uh, in a famous letter to Schumacher wrote, I protest first of all against the use of an infinite magnitude as something completed, which in mathematics is never perm permissible. Mathematics, is, infinity in mathematics is only a façon de parler, a figure of speech. And that, that was definitely the majority view. So that shows that the, the algorithmic approach to mathematics was the majority view up until Cantor came along. So let's go back for a moment and think about the birth of infinity. When did mathematicians really begin to notice that things could be infinite? And I would say that it was the list of prime numbers. Now remember prime numbers are those which cannot be factored among the positive integers. Are the primes without end? Euclid uh, provided a wonderful algorithm to show that the set of primes is infinite. He said, take any finite set of primes and put it into the algorithm, and the algorithm will spit out a prime which is not in that set. The way in which Euclid described the algorithm was simply by giving a, a, an example of it. You take two and three and five, you multiply them all together, you add one. That may or may not be a prime number, but if you factor it, you're not going to get two or three or five because they all leave a remainder one when you divide by them. And so in general, you can just do that for any set, finite set of prime numbers, multiply them all together, add one, factor it, and output the smallest prime. So that's very interesting because it shows that infinity from the start was an algorithmic concept. It was defined by an algorithm. If you have taken, uh, and we can use that, by the way, as, as a definition for an infinite set, that to show a set is infinite, you have to provide an algorithm such that for any finite collection of elements in the set, it will output something not in that finite collection. Interestingly, uh, mathematicians are not comfortable with the algorithmic nature of infinity. And if you read almost any textbook uh, you will find that they wrap Euclid's algorithm in a proof by contradiction. They say, assume there are only finitely many primes. Multiply them all together. Add one. Factor that. You get a prime not in that set. Therefore, the original assumption had to be wrong. But this whole proof by contradiction is completely extraneous. It makes it more complicated. Uh, and more than that, you often read that this is how Euclid did it. And this is sometimes uh, trump trumpeted as showing the power of proof by contradiction. So uh, there is something strange going on here. This is, this is again, the uh, tendency of mathematicians to try and make the subject logical rather than algorithmic. And this is just that proof. Uh, so. So up until the 19th century, the dominant trend in mathematics was algorithmic. And then came Georg Cantor, uh, who created the language of sets, sets, elements of sets, subsets of sets, uh, and so on. A wonderful language for describing all kinds of mathematical things. So unions, intersections, products, functions, but for Cantor, sets were material. They consisted of their elements. Uh, so we have the natural numbers, n. You can start with 0 or 1, depending on your point of view. It doesn't matter. Uh, so these are the natural numbers. So th these are some infinite sets, n, k, 
Q, the rational numbers, quotients, R, the real numbers. Uh, and this gives us an argument for completed infinities. The set of natural numbers surely exists. We talk about it all the time. N consists of all natural numbers. Therefore, all natural numbers exist. N is a completed infinity. But this course relies on the materiality of sets, which was part of Cantor's uh, view. Um, and Cantor did something else. He showed that, claimed to show, seemed to show, that the real numbers were a larger infinity than the natural numbers, that there were more real numbers than natural numbers. And that's even more impossible to think of it being potential because you can't even list the real numbers in a list, so it couldn't even be potentially infinite. It has to exist in this uh, paradise. Uh, all right, so let, let's talk about Cantor's diagonal argument. This, it, it's, it, it's an algorithm. Now, what is a real number? The, you know, think of pi. 3.141, et cetera. Now, by the way, computer scientists, uh, it, it's sort of a, a uh, macho contest among computer scientists to see who can compute the most digits of pi, and it's, it's up in the billions. Um, so what is pi? Well, it's, it's an algorithm which produces a decimal expansion. Uh, so Euclid's prime algorithm, the input was a finite set of primes, the output was a prime not in S. Cantor's diagonal al algorithm, the input is an infinite list of real numbers, which is an algorithm which enumerates an infinite list of algorithms, each of which gives you a real number. And Cantor's diagonal algorithm uh, outputs a real number different from everything in the list. You go down the diagonal changing digits. Uh, and like Euclid's algorithm, it's generally wrapped in an unnecessary proof by contradiction, but for Cantor's algorithm, it's historically accurate. So I already mentioned this, 95% of mathematicians. All right, B Eric Bishop was a mathematician, a professor at Berkeley, who discovered that he, uh, he could do away with the, the imagined realm of existence and where infinite sets uh, existed as totalities, completed infinite sets. Uh, he did this in, from 1967 to 73, uh, and after that uh, created a lot of controversy, a lot of publicity, and after that it died out. Uh, David Hilbert, in, who was the great mathematician of the early turn of the century, the 19th to 20th centuries, said uh, um, over an earlier controversy, the theory of conformal mappings and the fundamental theorems in partial differential equations and so on, these are merely ideal propositions that require non-algorithmic methods. Bishop showed Hilbert to have been totally wrong by accomplishing all that Hilbert had declared was impossible. All right, what's Bishop's approach to sets? He says, a set is constructed or defined by first describing what must be done to construct an arbitrary element of the set, second describing what must be done to prove that two elements of the set are equal, and third to prove that this equality relationship is reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. If you look, look at one and two, it doesn't seem like mathematical at all. You know, describe what must be done, describe what must be done. But the fact that we have proofs in there makes it mathematical, and Bishop was able to show that he could do all the things that Hilbert had declared impossible with this way of looking at sets. So a set does not consist of, it ele of its elements. Rather, the existence of the set creates the possibility of the existence of elements. Now, three certainly existed before anybody ever conceptualized the, s the set of all positive integers, but th three could not exist as an element of that set until the set itself existed. Infinite sets carry an extra structure from their definition. There is no such thing as just the material set consisting of the elements. And what Cantor's diagonal our algorithm shows is that there is a significant important difference between the natural numbers and the real numbers. 
but it might better be described in terms of complexity rather than size. The counter-revolution that Bishop tried uh, failed. He himself was universally recognized. He spoke at every major international conference, at every major college. His, he, his books were all published, but his students couldn't get, and he, he finally got discouraged and stopped writing and taking students, and he died of cancer at age 55. Bishop's students couldn't get good academic jobs. Nobody wanted a constructive mathematician to muddy the waters of the purity of uh, the Platonist view. Uh, Bishop's disciples had trouble getting their papers published, so there was a small coterie of converts, virtually all of them recently tenured. Uh, nobody who was still a student wanted to go that way because it was not a way you'd get a job. Uh, so, like me, I was a tenured professor at University of Texas, but I was young enough to change my mind. So. Uh, why was it hard for mathematicians to accept the view? First is that to think algorithmically, you have to change the logic that you use. You can't use law of excluded middle uncritically. The secret of being a good mathematician, one secret, is that you make logic subconscious. You don't have to think about the logical rules. They just come out automatically. And as psychoanalysts know, it's hard to change subconscious habits. Uh, and it seemed to require mentoring. I was mentored by a friend of Bishop who had by mentored, in turn mentored my friend. Uh, the, uh, there were a, so there was a small group, but it gradually died out. And nowadays, very few mathematicians even know what Bishop did. So what I'm arguing for, I'm not saying, by the way, that Frankel is wrong. Maybe he's a great mathematician. Maybe he sees something out there in space that I don't see, beyond space. But uh, the problem is that no, no one has that choice. Students uh, of mathematics are never told that they have a choice about how to think about it. Uh, the general public has no idea that uh, you can think of mathematics as a very high level programming language. Uh, matters of existence and equality uh, are always matters of convention. There is no such thing as an absolute identity of objects. This, everything is entangled with everything else. So you have to have conventions which tell you what must be done to show that something exists, what must be done to show that two things are equal. Uh, and Donald Nuth, a great, math, great computer scientist uh, of, the, uh, of the early era of computer science, had a dream that math and computer science might become the pure and applied branches of a school of algorithmics. Uh, and that dream is not even on the horizon because, and Knuth loved Bishop's book. Um, computer scientists understood Bishop, but Bishop wrote and spoke only to his fellow mathematicians who had, could not wrap their minds about what he was trying to do. So Knuth's dream of unifying mathematics and computer science uh, is, uh, at the moment, going nowhere. And that seems to be the end of my talk. Thank you. <laughs> Yes, Scott. My impression, I'm not a mathematician, but my impression is that Stephen my impression is that Stephen Wolfram has made this algorithm case that mathematics is algorithmic and that it is going to take over the world, but mm -hmm. he has anything to do with it. Well he's he's a powerful dynamo, so I hope he's right. I haven't followed Wolfram closely, but I, certainly Mathematica and Maple and other such things are are indeed in turning mathematics into a high-level programming language. That's true. I should have mentioned that. Thank you. Yes. Yes, Wolfgang. Um, I'm, I'm just curious. Um, did, did Bishop know uh, general semantics, or did he know Korsivsky? Do you know anything about that? I doubt it. There's no, okay. I, I don't know. I, I've met Bishop several times, but I don't really know him well enough to answer that question. Okay. What, what do you think it would have mean? No. Um, well, I just vaguely remember um, that um, since Korsivsky in his work uh, had a criti critique of uh, the, the concepts as commonly used of infinity and, and of uh, Cantor's uh, definitions and so on. Sure. So it, it, it seemed to me that there might be uh -huh. like... That's interesting. I, I, in, in, in several other ways. Well, anyway, yeah. I would love would to take talk to long more to about that with you, but you're leaving 
I'm leaving in the evening, but well, maybe we'll have talk. a chance. <laughs> Good. <laughs> <afternoon>. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Mathematics and algorithms will merge. There is a fundamental difference, and it's in the equal sign. A computer program is one directional. A mathematical statement is two directional. And well, you can't get them together. There's no way. I've tried. There are two equal signs in computer science. There's one where you give a value to a variable, but the other is where you test if two things are equal. So there, you, have, you have that. Anyway, I, I, I do not regard that as at all a fundamental difference between mathematics and computer science, but it, it is a peculiarity of, I mean, computer, computer languages discovered a lot of ambiguity in mathematics. Mathematicians use the equal sign, sort of, it's not clear, is it something which could be either true or false, or is it giving a value to something? Mathematicians don't distinguish between that, computer scientists do. So. All right. Well, thank you.